Good afternoon and welcome to today's energy seminar. We're really excited to introduce our speaker today, Natasha Cave. Uh, Natasha, like many of the students watching, uh, was a Stanford student up until about six years ago. She received her PhD in mechanical engineering, but worked with the Tom Hormiel's lab on electrocatalysis, primarily uh, on how to convert um, uh, carbon uh, in recycle carbon into usable uh, products. Uh, she then went out on to co-found uh, Opus 12, a uh, mid, uh, a middle aged uh, but highly successful uh, startup uh, so far. Um, just to give you a little, a uh, few of Atasha's awards. Um, she was an Excel Innovation Scholar and Echoing Green Fellow at Smithsonian Institution Innovators to Watch in 2018. And Vanity Fair named uh, Cave one of the 26 women of color diversifying entrepreneurship in Silicon Valley uh, media and beyond. And I think probably her next job uh, coming up real soon will be something like Starship Captain as a uh, Star Trek uh, fan. I would like to acknowledge uh, both the uh, Stanford Technology uh, Ventures Program for uh, helping out uh, Atasha as well as Brian Bartholomew's in the uh, Innovation Transfer Program for the Tomcat. And uh, those two groups were two of many groups that strongly recommended having Atasha come speak to us today. So she's gonna talk uh, about what they do at the company and how they got there. It's a very interesting and innovative uh, story. Uh, just to give you an idea how interesting it is, uh, not many companies uh, get highlighted and featured in both Rolling Stone and the New York Times. Uh, so I'm sure that there's an interesting story uh, uh, behind that. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over uh, to Atasha to give her energy seminar today uh, entitled Building a Clean Tech Company at a Capital Constrained World. Uh, Atasha, take it away. Yeah, thank you so much, John. I uh, really appreciate that highlight. And yes, I would love to be in space someday and um, hopefully our technology can be one part of um, a future space mission. Uh, how did I know that, right? <laughs> Wild guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm really going to talk today about um, the roadmap to creating Opus 12 um, really as a uh, informative view to, to, you know, share our journey such that others can eventually follow. And, you know, the problem that uh, we face as co-founders when we're first starting out is that it's it's really challenging to bring hard scientists into a commoditized world, uh, especially in energy where you know um, the electrons that come into your house, the electricity that we use, uh, is very commoditized. You're not paying a premium for you know expensive electrons. Like uh, people get that electricity and they want it to be as low cost as possible. And so if you have this innovation that um, you're trying to bring into the world, there is this big gap between um, kind of where you might be with the science and where you need to be with the product. And crossing over that gap um, just can be done, but it requires um, some strategies, some, some of which we've leveraged, and there's many, many ways to do this. Um, and then, um, you know, also requires like, creating an ecosystem. And so, you know, I'm really gonna, uh, focus on, you know, how does one bring a capital intensive kind of hard tech company to fruition? Um, and I say this is not as like, it's the way again, it's just a way. Um, and, and I hope that there's some bits of information that can be taken from that. So before I start off about the roadmap, I just want to just give a high level uh, description of what does Opus 12 do to make sure everyone uh, is on the same page. And so, you know, at Opus 12, we basically are building a uh, CO2 electrolyzer that takes in carbon dioxide, water, and electricity and uses metal catalyst inside the, the system to create in products that can be fuels, liquid fuels, for example, or other types of compounds, materials even, we can make polymers. And then we also uh, emit carbon dioxide excuse me, excuse me, oxygen in that process um, as shown here in the slide. 
Um, now, when I was a grad student here, um, we studied the basic science side of this process. So we worked with a computational group, we published papers uh, where we, you know, theorize of how this reaction is working. And you can see here, this is a CO2 to methane step. And um, the computational group we worked with um, really, you know, identified each different step looking for ways to gain understanding in the reaction. Um, and then my group in uh, Tom Hadamio's group, we did more of the experimental side where we, you know, um, took some things from theory and said, okay, you know, how, um, you know, how can we implement that? Use that understanding to gain um, more knowledge around CO2 lecture reduction. And so, you know, when we were thinking about um, starting the company, that there were a bunch of uh, technological innovations and understandings that had uh, come through the many years that uh, I was here doing my PhD. Uh, but, you know, there really was one factor that determined uh, whether or not it would make sense to start a company. And that one factor was really just economics. Um, we saw that there was a trend in the electrolyzers that we would be building where their costs are coming down. And then we also saw this trend around renewable electricity or carbon-free electricity, where that cost was also coming down. Uh, you know, in some cases, I had this like 10x advantage from where it was, um, say, 20 years ago. And that has really been the key driver. That trend is what we are leveraging the most to really uh, build our company that we can provide um, these you know, liquid fuels and these compounds at costs that are comparable to the petroleum equivalent because we can take advantage of these trends um, as we start to build our company. And I really wanna stress that um, because I've, you know, as I've talked with other people who are looking to become founders, um, really this, the first step is understanding the techno-economics, understanding how that 10X increase that you got in the lab on the technology side, how does that translate into the economics? Does that get you to a break-even point is it what the customers care about? How much are the customers willing to pay? Um, and these questions, um, you know, were, were part of the questions I actually, um, you know, learned through several entrepreneurship courses here at Stanford, and then also the um, Excel Scholars Program is, you know, where you talked a lot about how do you understand what the customer wants and build the technology for that. Um, so, you know, beyond kind of what Opus 12 does, I'm gonna start to talk about kind of our journey to creating the company. So. It really started off, um, you know, again, towards the end of my PhD, I um, approached a fellow lab mate, uh, Kendra Cool. Uh, she and I worked together during our PhD time, and uh, we both studied different metals, but both worked on CO2 lecture reduction and had uh, similar kind of levels of knowledge acquisition around the reaction. And so I, I approached her and said, hey, you know, what do you think about starting a company around this? Like, you know, we are, you know, one of very few people in the world who could bring this technology to fruition. Um, what do you think about starting that? So we started to work in our free time and, and got together and started uh, mapping things out. And then we, then, you know, later on, I went to a, um, a clean tech event uh, where um, there was Nicholas Flanders, who I had actually met previously at a space club event at Stanford. And, um, you know, at this clean tech event on a Saturday, um, they had business school students and engineering school students come together to talk about clean tech challenges and how we can overcome them through entrepreneurship. And so I pitched at that time, which is graduate research and said that there's a business plan competition we'd like to do. So Nicholas joined on board and the three of us started Opus 12. Um, and that was a handful of years ago. Um, and, you know, as we were kind of thinking about how to build this company, um, you know, we kind of, well, these I sort of perhaps naively thought that, okay, well, we'll just go down Sand Hill Road and start asking for funding. We, you know, we're three Stanford students. We have some neat ideas. And there was a, there was an app around that time that had just raised a million dollars. And the app, it, you pushed a button and it sent a yo to someone else who had the app. And they, you know, they raised a million dollars for this. And I'm like, okay, we could um, at least raise a million dollars for our idea, which should have much larger impact. Um, and we quickly realized that wasn't the case, that many um, VCs and institutional investors at, at that time were not really investing in clean tech because they had, in essence, lost money on this initial wave of clean tech companies that happened in the, 
the early 2000s, around like 2008, 2009 timeframe. Um, so we had to then sort of be very strategic about how we were gonna get sort of seed funding. And there were several players in this ecosystem that we could tap into. And the first um, member of that is the Tom Cat Center. And um, you know, Brian Bartholomew, um, I initially met at a clean tech event and told him like, look, you know, we have this graduate research we're working on. I'm not sure if it's if it's suitable or if it's um, can, you know, can be ready for industry. And he really encouraged me to think about, okay, like, you know, just um, think about how you would translate that into industry and then, you know, think about applying for a Tomcat grant. And so we did, and that gave us the funding to get supplies for, um, to sort of think about building our first prototype. We also got into a program at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab called Psychotron Road. Um, and they now are part of a larger group called Activate. And through that, um, particular uh, program, over the course of two years, we were able to receive a, a, you know, a million dollars of, of fellowship support that would help us to uh, build this prototype. So we got you know, in-kind support such as lab space, access to equipment at the lab. Uh, we also um, you know, uh, were able to get mentorship through the program. And then we also got uh, fellowship support, so direct funding through uh, salaries and supplies and, and uh, travel grants and, and the like. And, and we could use that, those, that funding to build our first prototype. Then we also could leverage the fact that we were at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab to then get um, additional early stage SBIR funding. So the, the federal government has this Small Business Innovation Research Program, or SBIR, um, and, and pretty much every agency that does research has them. Um, the National Science Foundation, they are um, really focused on creating uh, deep tech scalable companies. They're pretty techno technology agnostic and just want to um, see more deep tech companies in the US. So that would be the first place that we, we started. And I would recommend anyone starting at that is getting an, looking into an SBIR grant uh, we then were able to um, apply for funds through NASA because our technology can be used in space. Uh, methane is actually the rocket fuel of choice for going to Mars. And so we could um, make methane from the atmosphere on Mars, which happens to be 95% carbon dioxide. And then we could also apply for funding through the US Department of Energy. And so these additional grants that we were able to bring in really allowed us to hire our first set of employees and really start to shift from an idea-centric kind of uh, proof of concept to more of a prototype. And next, what we did is we also were able to leverage early stage um, commercial partnerships. So Shell has a game changer program where you apply for a grant. It's very similar to the SBIR program, in fact. And we were able to receive money to support the work. Uh, SoCal Gas was also really interested in, in supporting our work to, to build a a world in which the CO2 emissions, say from dairy farms or from biogas, can be converted into uh, more of a uh, more like low carbon or carbon neutral uh, uh, synthetic natural gas. Um, and so, with these two early commercial partners, um, we were able to show to you know any potential investor, as we were having conversations with investors, that there was some interest from larger and bigger companies. And so with, with having some uh, you know, funding from the federal government to build our prototype and philanthropic funding, and also now to have kind of early interest from commercial partnerships, we could start to think about maybe raising money in the private sector. And so our first step into that was actually getting it into StartX, uh, which was really helpful in, in helping us think about you know, what are other companies at our stage um, what valuations are they getting? What type of investors are they talking to? Uh, how does one go about um, fundraising? And a lot of these really practical lessons were really great as we started to think about raising our own round. So in raising our own round, I, I would say we started to go into a phase that I'm calling commercial R&D and pilots. Um, and for that, we were able to bring in new partnerships. So we, we were able to approach various family offices and deep tech institutional investors. Uh, so, so the Dolby family is one representative family office where 
they have money where they want to deploy it to um, make lives better or create impact on, on climate and other, other sort of major problems in the world. And they're a lot more patient than a VC fund, which has maybe a 10 year fund that has to make a certain return um, within that time period. Whereas, you know, these family offices are more looking at things in more of a longer term horizon. They still want a return, um, but doesn't need to fit within a 10, 10 year time scale. Um, DCVC is a deep tech institutional investor. They invest in, in space companies and other sort of deep co companies. So very uh, mission aligned there where they understand that um, the growth for deep tech is very different. And then uh, Evoke, which is backed by Canadian oil and gas companies that are feeling a lot of pressure um, from the Canadian government to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. In fact, they are, they're actually being uh, uh, taxed um, for their carbon emissions. And so they created this uh, investment, investment arm that focuses on companies such as ours to, um, that can in the future you know, um, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so we were able to bring in this private funding that's, that's still very mission aligned, still not the, the kind of traditional um, venture capital uh, funding, but folks that really understood what we were doing. And we only could do that though, once we had you know, built the prototype and show that um, early day that it could work and, so, and leveraging that early funds to do that. So at this point, you know, we had um, leveraged the private funding to really package and create our first sort of commercial unit. And here it is shown, um, this is about two years ago now, um, our team in the lab. And a little fun fact, just to throw at you. So the day that our uh, unit came in from our manufacturing partner was the same day that uh, Bill Gates happened to be visiting to do a film for uh, Netflix. So if you've ever seen um, the, the Netflix special of Bill Gates' brain, if you go to episode number three, and if you're very careful, uh, there's like two seconds where uh, we're shown in, in, that, in that image. So just a little fun fact. Um, but now that we had our unit a unit built, um, we could then start to, you know, think about doing some engagements with corporate partners to really sort of build relationships. And one engagement we did was with Daimler. So Daimler has interest in building a carbon negative vehicle. So with, from day one, it has um, some carbon that's already sequestered within it. And so we were able to use our system to build this uh, internal car part made out of CO2. So if you look up in the upper uh, middle of the slide, you can see there's this part called the C-pillar. And we made that uh, with our system. And the in, in general, we are trying to do more of these because one thing that's really can be challenging with a, with a company where you have one and only one sort of commercial product that you don't want to just send um, to you know, one of many commercial partners you know, it's like the question is how do you build a relationship and how do you, um, you know, progressively show that you can um, provide value to this company and kind of go through this much longer sales cycle. And so part of it is really breaking down and saying like, what, it, you know, what is something we can do now to really show that, um, so the potential of our part and show that, you know, we can um, make something on a smaller scale and then that can grow into a much larger scale. And having something that the customer can see and touch and hold uh, is, is super valuable. And getting to that point um, was really been uh, a key moment for us to really build these relationships that could have longer time horizons. Um, and, and speaking of longer time horizons, I mean, we have uh, still many miles to go before we sleep. Um, you know, we've built our first unit, um, that, that unit I showed previous, previously, it's about the size of a dishwasher. Um, and we're currently scaling up to these larger units, which are shown here. So the most largest one, number four, is the size of an entire building. And size number three uh, would fit into a shipping container to give you a sense of size. And size number two would be like an industrial refrigerator size. Um, and so, you know, as we're scaling up, we still um, have this sort of like valley of death that, that's um, been touted for companies like ours, where we have Kind of early stage indications of a prototype that works. Uh, you know, we have a team, we have a kind of first of a kind unit, 
uh, but we're still not quite at the level where we're fully deploying our system. And so um, luckily for us that there's, you know, there's been an ecosystem that's all, also developing to help companies cross that valley of death. So we've seen um, in the Department of Energy, for example, they've started creating larger programs that are focused on, okay, um, you know, let's do, let's scale up to this, uh, to your larger system. Let's look at getting it out into the field. And so um, there's been programs through, through Netto and Vito that have been um, larger ticket grants. RPE recently had a program, it's, it's, still, it's still ongoing, um, that's called Scale Up, where it's for previous um, RPE recipients to now get a larger grant to do their first of a kind in, in the field deployment. Um, and then there's the U.S. Air Force, which um, I, you know, I have been really impressed with some of the changes that they've made um, within the Air Force and this AFWorks group specifically, which is more of a, a moonshot kind of um, skunk works group where they are really wanting to get more innovation in the U.S. and, and, and with a focus on getting into the military, where they said, okay, you know, you start off and you'll get a phase one, that's a much smaller grant, but then you'll have a phase two that's a bit larger. And then we'll work with you to get a phase three, which could be sort of $10 million on that, on that level to really get your, um, your unit out into the field. And so that's still in the works with, with the US Air Force, but in talking with some of the folks who are running that program, um, they really are focused on being very uh, founder friendly and, and focused on you know, getting innovation as smooth as possible and removing friction to do so. So, Really, this stage is kind of where we're at now. Uh, we're, we're kind of in that sort of valley of death and we're starting to cross into the next stage of sort of commercial integration where we do our first of a kind, much larger plant. And so I talked previously about how we you know, leverage um, you know, philanthropic and federal funds and also you know, got some early commercial partners to kind of get us to this point. And so now I'm talking about how we can continue to be capital light as we start to really build out our system and build our larger scale units. And so there's, there's two uh, ways in which we've kind of focused on that. One is uh, leveraging existing manufacturing facilities. Um, and the other is uh, project financing. So with, you know, with manufacturing facilities, like this, this is a picture of a manufacturing floor it's not the entire floor, but it's a fraction of it. But this, this facility costs $100 million to, to build. And um, you know, if we think about us as a company, we'd have to raise another $100 million to replicate this exact manufacturing floor. Um, but instead, we could you know, say, you know, form a partnership with, with this particular company and say, can we use some of your excess capacity? Can we help you uh, build out uh, additional space within your manufacturing floor to, to uh, basically produce our, our system. And that allows us to basically focus on our core technology, which is shown here in the upper right. Our core technology really is just the electrode that goes into these electrolyzers. Um, the analogy that we often use is that, you know, in your uh, laptop, you have a CPU or chip that's made by, say, Intel. Um, and, and Intel just makes a chip. They don't make the entire laptop. They sell those to other manufacturers. So we're the same way. We make the electrode and that electrode goes into um, these reactors that are already built at scale. And so that has allowed us to really save time and cost. And we're not the only ones that have done this. I've, I've heard of other companies like in the food industry, for example, leveraging other contract, uh, contract manufacturing. Um, and so that's sort of one question I often um, you know, bring to other founders is like, how can you leverage existing assets and existing uh, manufacturing capacity to bring your technology to market um, very quickly and very, very cheaply. The second, as I mentioned, is uh, project financing. So there are some new entities that are um, coming in the ecosystem to really support companies in the clean tech space to do project financing. And some of them are focused on the first through fifth um, sort of initial projects. Um, and then some of them are, you know, private only, some are public-private um, initiatives. And 
uh, with project financing, we're able to support a larger installation without having to use equity financing. So at, without having to dilute our cap table, we can basically use debt to, um, to build out that capital. And what allows us to uh, potentially leverage capital financing or project financing, and I should make it clear that we haven't actually done this yet, this is in the future. Um, but what makes it possible to leverage project financing is that we can get a contract for the inputs uh, and a contract for the outputs. And when you have a you know, multi-year contract on both sides, um, that is something that's very much attractive to a financier because um, they can run the model, look at the cost and, and can charge you know, some cost of capital to do so. And what that would look like, you know, as we start to grow is that you could imagine our system here. So here's the shipping container size system that would be housed at a, you know, existing polymer manufacturer, which here again, we're not having to build out the entire polymer, polymer manufacturing um, ecosystem. We're just an add on to an existing system where we're taking their CO2 admissions that they already have on site, piping it into our system. And then the output of that would be the same um, molecules that they're already using to make polymers and we can just make it from their CO2. Uh, but that is a capital improvement and a capital investment. And so we would couple a, a project financing um, as we approach a customer and say, you know, we have project financing lined up. Would you like to host our system? And then we can do things like um, charge per molecule um, so that the polymer manufacturer doesn't have to take on the burden of finding this new capital to bring up this new system. So, you know, as we think even beyond kind of crossing this valley of death and that, you know, we get to the point where we're at scale, um, there's still ways in which we can be very strategic about how we deploy our systems. So first is, you know, there's um, many different types um, and geographical locations where there's CO2 emissions. And so, you know, we can sort of think about, okay, what are the lower hanging fruit? Where can we go to get CO2 emissions that would be the cheapest uh, CO2 that would be concentrated that we can uh, pipe into our system? And even beyond the United States, we can also think globally. Um, there's a lot of movement in Europe where they're looking at, you know, rebuilding their infrastructure, um, even, even prior to COVID, but certainly now that um, COVID has happened and they're looking to boost their economy. Um, the question is, you know, can we rebuild infrastructure with having CO2 emission, uh, CO2 utilization built in? Um, and so we can sort of think about how to be strategic within, within that space. There's also some really interesting policy that's coming through on the US side, of course, with our recent election, this could uh, potentially change. Uh, but we, there are some laws that are uh, on the books that have been established. So the uh, 45Q, which is a tax credit for the use of carbon uh, dioxide, either through sequestering it or utilizing it. And that is on the books, that's in, in law. Um, there's also some legislation that was in the works and that has to do with you know, utilizing CO2 um, through maybe a, a carbon dioxide pipeline, um, building on infrastructure around that, leveraging um, Department of Energy to uh, create grants for CO2 utilization. Um, and so there's a lot of um, excitement and we're looking at new trends around this policy landscape, which absolutely helps when we um, you know, engage with other parties around this um, carbon tech and clean tech uh, ecosystem. And, and uh, you know, most importantly, um, you know, we've seen a lot of corporates um, put out pledges. So um, Stripe, um, you know, did pay for their carbon offsets. They paid a pretty nice high, a pretty high um, cost per ton. They paid up to like $600 per ton for, uh, for the carbon, which was great. It, it, you know, it, even though 1 million is a small amount in the grand scheme of things, but it, it really sends a strong signal that there's companies out there willing to do that and hopefully other companies will follow suit. Uh, and Microsoft, of course, made this really uh, big, big pledge, which included this $1 billion climate innovation fund. Um, and so again, just like stronger signals coming out of um, corporations that they wanna take an active role in 
uh, reducing their CO2 emissions. And so um, we see that as new trends that we can take as we move forward with the company. So you know, in conclusion, before we take companies, I mean, I'd say, you know, as, as I look through the roadmap of our company, um, we basically are, are leveraging an industrial ecosystem that's being put into place. Um, from the very beginning where we were leveraging philanthropic and federal funds um, all the way up to leveraging corporate grants. Um, and then as we move into a space where we're now leveraging existing manufacturing um, capacity, both to build our system and to deploy it. Um, and now, you know, as we go into the future, we'd be looking at leveraging CO2 policy that's coming out of the federal government and globally, um, as well as corporate pledges um, for CO2 abatement. So, um, you know, one of my favorite things that we calculated is we figured out how do we compare to trees in terms of CO2 conversion power. And so, um, you know, within the size of our scaled up unit, so um, a single stack, it's about the size of a checked in suitcase. And we can put the CO2 conversion power of about 37,000 trees in a, a stack that again has a footprint of a suitcase. And so, you know, just like a tree operates within um, an ecosystem, we also have an ecosystem which we're, which we're leveraging to uh, really build out our company and, and uh, bring it to market. Thanks, Atasha. That was uh, fantastic. I feel like I had a class in entrepreneurship and another class in chemical engineering all wrapped into uh, one talk. Uh, so we do have a number of questions. I'll try to uh, gather them together. Uh, for me, I'm kind of a technology assessment modeling type guy. So there are a number of questions uh, regarding, um, and it's very nice that you had this nice flow. When, if ever, did you have to actually produce kind of economic numbers apropos of your early graphs on comparative technologies? I assume at the beginning, people was, were willing to let you prove out the technology and so on, but do you now have to, or at what point did you have to have specific uh, uh, you know, inputs and products and kind of cost everything out in a spreadsheet or something like that. Yeah, I would say from the from the very beginning, really, because when we applied to Cyclotron Road, part of that application was focused on okay, what are the technoeconomics? And and Elon Gurr, who's the director of the program, uh, we had met actually through a business plan competition uh, prior to applying to Cyclotron Road, and he was the biggest proponent of. Of, you know, us sitting down and really doing a thorough technical economic model. So having Nicholas, who had a background at McKinsey and um, was, you know, used to doing modeling and, um, and really like dove in very quickly and, and built out a technical economic model. Um, you know, we, we improved upon that and have more details and, and more resolution, but it was absolutely critical from, the, from day one to show that we could have a pathway to be cost competitive with petroleum. So two follow-ups to that. Uh, uh, are you able to tell us which products looked good then and which ones look good now? And a related but more macro question is, um, when do you anticipate you'll be turning a quote unquote, turning a profit? Yeah, so when we first got started, the product that we were looking at was direct CO2 to ethanol. And part of that was that it, it was a huge value proposition for corn ethanol producers. So when you make corn ethanol, which 10% of what you put in your car is, uh, is ethanol, mostly from corn. And when you produce it, for every ton of ethanol you make, you make a ton of CO2. So we could take that CO2 and uh, increase their yield by 50%. And the CO2 that comes out is already super concentrated. It'd be really cheap and easy to, to, um, to pipe that CO2 into our system and then make ethanol from it. Um, the reason we pivoted from that was because we, we, you know, it's kind of this like valley of death problem. It's like the, our first system for a corn ethanol producer would have to be on the order of, you know, a hundred million dollars. And we had seen from previous companies that had some type of uh, novel green fuel and tried to raise a hundred million dollars for their first unit, um, that that was where they oftentimes, um, no longer became a company. And so, you know, in some ways I would say we had like last mover advantage in that and that we could see that that was clearly gonna be um, 
you know, a, a, a downside. And so we kind of uh, went back to the drawing board, uh, leveraged the lean startup methodology, which, you know, Steve Blank, at least back then taught here at Stanford. I actually took that course um, from him when he, when he taught it. The um, hacking four. Oh, is that what it's called a hacking four? Yeah, that's what he calls all his classes now, hacking for entrepreneurship, ha hacking for defense, uh, oh, okay. you know, et cetera. Yeah. It's yeah, like I, a huge, and actually he's proliferated those courses around the world, I think, so. That's right, yeah, because we, we also did it um, through NSF i program. Um, but yeah, but I mean, going back to those principles of just doing customer discovery and customer interviews, we were able to find that um, by actually making um, carbon monoxide out of carbon dioxide, that there would be smaller markets that we could go into. And so we could, you know, build a smaller system, um, put it out into the world, bring in revenue from that system, um, and then also show that the technology works and de-risk the technology early on. So that's our first products right now. Um, and just to be clear, because carbon monoxide is often something you hear about as something you don't want in your home. Uh, but it's a uh, pretty useful industrial molecule. Um, you can use it to make liquid fuel. You could uh, use it to make polymers. Um, there's a whole range of things that you can use on various scales. So um, we found a way in which we can um, very economically uh, compete with, with the petroleum equivalent. So that's, that's what we pivoted to. Um, as far as... Um, when we become profitable. Um, yeah, I think, you know, we certainly have a roadmap um, to when, when that would happen. And, and, and um, I think there's several pathways in which we would get there. Um, but we're, we're targeting within the next five years to um, have a profitable company. Um, the thing about our system is like, once we scale up to these larger systems, uh, they are, you know, they are pretty large. And so that it does bring in a lot of revenue because we've been able to uh, be very capital light um, and, and, you know, um, and basically, you know, leverage um, various sources of funding, um, we should be able to get to a point where we would be profitable much quicker than had we just solely had to take equity financing. Well, one way to go that may be an interesting uh, uh, challenge for you all to decide is acquisition. Are you now on people's radars, it seems to you might be for some of the big uh, petrochemical and oil company firms. Are you um, in, uh, have you been approached about being acquired by uh, a big, say a big fortune 500 type company or maybe a more new wave uh, company that isn't in the fortune 500 but will be soon? Well, <laughs> I'll say, um... To the extent you can actually talk about yeah. it, I do. Yeah, yeah I, I'll say that, um, you know, I think any entrepreneur um, likes to keep all pathways open. And so, um, you know, we're not, if, if we find the right partner and the, you know, the right partner approaches us, we would uh, definitely consider that. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay, then there's a number of questions about flows. You had that very nice map with all the sources, which I really liked, and that, tied into the regulations. So uh, I get there's a big range. Uh, one that's less concentrated is the air itself. Uh, is there a version of this technology that could be used for direct air capture on the one end? And then if you add up all the uh, industrial uses that you could reasonably expect to do, how big of a dent in the uh, carbon if you could call it that, the carbon gap would, would that make? I'm, I'm assuming you've probably scoped that out. Yeah, in fact, we've we've worked with um, a couple of direct air capture companies to write uh, joint grants together. And so if we're awarded those grants, we'll be working together to um, to build what, what could be the first like integrated direct air capture CO2 utilization system. Um, but that's, you know, TBD. So we'll see uh, what happens in that um, grant process. But yeah, absolutely within our vision is to um, eventually couple with direct air capture and scale that up and have a pathway to make the liquid fuels um, coupled with a direct air capture system. And then, then if you can do something like that, you're really amplifying the impact that uh, direct air capture has uh, by displacing um, you know, petroleum-based fuels or um, displacing 
uh, material or you know, getting materials that are carbon negative. Um, and in terms of uh, potential impact, I mean, if you if you look on the um, you know, global scale, um, you know, about 25% of the CO2 emissions that we see are ones that fit into this kind of industrial category of, you know, are pretty concentrated, um, can be readily piped into um, to our, to our system and, and molecules can be created that can be uh, distributed to other off takers. Um, and then, you know, when we look at kind of like our sort of 10 year horizon, um, you know, we, we see, you know, a pathway where we can be, you know, converting, you know, say in, within the US, you know, have like, you know, single digit percents, let's say 8% um, uh, CO2 impact. That's, that's if we're very much like at full scale and really turning the crank. Um, there's lots of potential to be able to uh, utilize and reduce and convert CO2 emissions. Um, yep. I, I'm just not hesitant to, to give numbers because there's so many pathways, you know, we're, there's so many ways that this can go. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, we can yeah. decide as a country that we really want to take on this and then, you know, then it's a much faster pathway or, yeah. or we could not, in which case it'd be a lot slower. Uh, maybe maybe uh, this week we will decide to do so. Um, so you did uh, mention early uh, uh, collaborations with Shell and uh, whatnot. It seems to be a lot of industrial uh, emissions, as you well know, are outside the U.S. So do you have any potential uh, collaborations? Maybe they're included in the uh, work with the internationals in China, India, you know, you name it, uh, outside the U.S., where there's a lot of industrial emissions right now. Yeah, we, we don't have any strong partnerships in China or India, but we are uh, very much looking at Europe. Um, we've gotten lots of inbound um, requests and, and interest from, from European companies. And so much that we're, we're really looking at, okay, should we um, you know, think about like having a subsidiary in, in Europe and should we um, you know, really, um, like really be involved and really, really go after some of that um, funding that's being available both on the corporate side and in the in the uh, EU or kind of larger uh, federal side, um, but with with China and India, uh, you know, we have had some initial talks with companies. It's just it's um it's a little bit um, sometimes it's a bit tricky because since we are very early stage, that um, you know we've been doing these early pilots with companies that. You know where we can make a a specific you know piece and kind of have that um, be the start of a larger engagement. Where I think you know for our, for other markets like you know China or India, you know we don't have a, a ton of uh, experience and knowledge in those those regions. And also you know the the companies we've talked to in those regions tend to want you know to, to like buy a system once it's once it's ready to go. We're open. The, uh, then we have a, 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 a few um, kind of hardcore strategy questions. Who are your competitors and what is your, um, how do you, how are you different than them? I, obviously some of the technology things are, are one piece and then you're leveraging financing and facilities would be just from listening to your talk, but how, to the extent you're able to do so, can you talk about that a little bit? Who are the big competitors and why do you think you're going to win the race other than having Bill Gates drop by, which seems like a pretty good strategy? Yeah. I would say our biggest competitor, honestly, is a status quo. It's still in most places free to throw away CO2. And, um, and so, you know, um, even though there might be a, um, a revenue positive pathway, there's still, you, know, you still have to deploy capital. There's still, um, you know, business risk you're taking, even if we, you know, completely de-risk the technology. And certainly now there's technical risk as well. And so um, I, I would say that's that's really our, our biggest competitor. Now, in terms of other CO2 utilization companies, I mean, there's there's companies that fit in the, you know, that that you say like a biochemical process or thermochemical process, and you know, in comparison to those categories, we think electrochemistry, which is what we use, um, we'll have some really strong advantages and, and uh, strong um, 
in a strong position because the cost of electricity of renewable electricity is coming down so much. Um, and we're, we are you know, creating a world in which there's more wind and solar and, and, and carbon free electricity that's more and more available. Um, our system can operate intermittently. So we can actually take um, electricity that is uh, lower, lower cost because it's, it's at a low demand time. It's being produced at a, at a, at a low demand time. So, you know, for, um, you know, a biochemistry or thermochemistry uh, type technology, you don't necessarily have those uh, advantages in, in leveraging the cost of electricity. I should also make clear that there's like so much CO2 out there that like, I think it'll be a situation where there's like multiple players. I don't, I don't think there's oh, yeah. going to be yeah. a silver bullet that like one company or even one like type of like CO2 utilization play will win. Um, but, but, you know, I, I do think we have some very strategic advantages and, and, and for very specific places, we can um, be the clear, clear choice. Um, now within the, um, there's a couple other companies that are doing electrochemistry. And I would say there, it's just, you know, um, we see a clear technology advantage, um, which I, I would happy to go into the weeds with, but that may not be as, as uh, interesting, but I would say on a high level that, um, you know, our, um, our system, which is, uh, is a PIM system, uh, so polymer electrolyte membrane, that system has been around for decades in the water electrolyzer space. So we're able to leverage a lot of uh, technical know-how, a lot of uh, cost reduction um, on the manufacturing side. And so we really see that as giving us a huge advantage. I have a, a, another uh, a question that a few people were, were wondering about. So you, you did go through the uh, helpful and maybe there are some unhelpful government policies and regulations. Uh, just uh, coincidentally, I've done pretty big studies on 45Q, low carbon fuel standard, mm -hmm. et cetera. We could have a Green No Deal back on your infrastructure side. There could be a form of the Green New Deal that's heavy on infrastructure. You know, why would I think that this week? Um, so I guess the question for me is how closely do you track that? Do you have like a government affairs person on your team already? Or just do you just use personal contacts? Obviously that could affect the spreadsheet calculations that you all do for what's gonna be a good way to go. And this is part of the Michael Porter, you know, international uh, version of corporate strategy studies as well. Yeah, uh, so we're a bit too small to have a dedicated corporate affairs person. Um, I'd love to see the day when we can have someone um, that's focused on that because it, it, it certainly will be um, a, an impactful force as we grow our company. Um, but right now, as we're really small, we're able to leverage groups such as Carbon 180. They're a nonprofit group that is looking at the carbon tech space as a whole and um, you know, sponsoring studies and um, sponsoring even entrepreneurship programs and really kind of looking to see this um, you know, carbon space broadly, which includes um, you know, all, all the types of technologies and, and not, just, not just one specific one and, um, and even you know, looks at like sequestration um, and, and kind of how that can play into um, a you know, carbon free or, or reduced carbon world. Um, and so we're able to leverage some of the work that they do and, and keep abreast of, of the policies. Um, there's also um, you know, um, other, other groups and um, even going to kind of conferences around the Department of Energy can kind of uh, pick up things here and there. So uh, it's all uh, still, still very scrappy in, in that sense that we, um, we kind of pick up things yeah. here and there, but we're certainly keeping an eye on it for sure. Great, we're running out of time, but I would be remiss if I didn't ask one question on behalf of all the students. And this comes in bits and pieces is based on uh, what you've done and what you've learned so far, what advice would you give to the students in the audience, uh, particularly budding entrepreneurs, particularly things, uh, I think I saw in your ETL talk, you had a bit of this on what things did you do that were really a good idea? What things that you uh, do in your career so far, it's amazing how far you've gotten uh, that uh, were maybe not as successful as the other the other ones. <laughs> yeah, oh boy, this, this, I could do a whole seminar on that. You, I'll bet you could. Well, I think you almost did one, but I thought for this audience, it would be nice to get a summary of what you said. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I would say, you know, um, Stanford is a huge resource and I would, uh, you know, I, I leveraged it as much as I could when I was there, but I would, uh, if I could go back and do it again, I would, I would kind of earlier on um, add in some entrepreneurship uh, type courses, you know, like I mentioned Lean Startup, which I took, and then the Excel Scholars Program, um, uh, you know, uh, programs such as that, um, you know, I mean, even Tomcat, I mean, like, all the, uh, there's all these resources there. And it's amazing how quickly you get cut off from them once you, <laughs> once you graduate. Um, and so, I, you know, I would say, um, you know, taking some time to think about the bigger picture and kind of plan out um, uh, what you want to do as next steps before you, before you do graduate. That was one thing that um, I did a, a little bit of before, before we left. We started the company before I, I had I graduated and that uh, was, was a huge help, and a huge res uh, resource that we could leverage for kind of knowledge sake and, and strategic value. Um, things I would do uh, differently is uh, think about personal finances. I, I this, and I'm not I'm not sure how this myth kind of goes around the valley, but certainly for clean tech founders, it is not, um, you know, it, it's a very low in salary because you are uh, being very scrappy and like, you know, you can't just like pay yourself um, really high amounts of money. You still have to report to your investors and especially if you're getting government grants, there's, you know, um, you have to like, Keep your salary within the national average. So um, when I graduated, um, you know, I like my personal finances weren't the best that they could have been had I been thinking the whole time that I would start a company, as opposed to thinking the whole time I would go get a really nice job at like Google or Facebook. In which case, I you know was like, well, let me just spend some money now so that um, you know once I get this job, then I can pay it back really easily. So I had a little bit of debt. Um, when I when I graduated, which I was able to eventually pay off, but uh, if I had to do it again, it would it would have been nice to not have that financial anxiety when I was uh, starting the company. Great. Well, Natasha, uh, thanks so much. Now a bunch of very lucky Stanford students will get to talk to you a little bit more up close and personal after we shut down here. So thanks for an inspirational uh, seminar and giving us all hope for the future. Thanks again. Yeah. Thank you.